Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge & Company. I know you have to repeatedly test a rocket to be sure it takes off, but does repeatedly testing a child ensure an education that produces a learned person? Donna Neville, a noted public educator and community psychologist, thinks there are better ways to do that, and she's met my guest today, and I welcome you. What I like okay. about you, <laughs> because you're charming and lovely, is that you equate education with the basic principles of equality and justice. And I don't see that now in the way we're educating children and in the way our educational system is, is built up. So what do you mean by that? Well, I think, I mean, as you said, I think I and many others are really concerned about an education system, a public education system that really is well serving all our children and that's providing the kind of education they deserve. And what we're seeing increasingly is a system that doesn't do that, where um, testing is replacing meaningful learning and critical thinking, where a top-down approach, a system where the mayor is in control of our, our school system, is replacing a partnership among parents, educators, students, and the community to really build the kind of education system that our children need and deserve. And, and when you talk about the education system, I mean, we're talking about f educating the children so they learn how to think, basically, and how they can create and imagine what a world could be like. I mean, it's an optimistic kind of thing. It's not where you have to pass a test tomorrow. It's how you become a good citizen, isn't it? Or what, what is the public good or something? I mean, isn't there a richness to the kind of education you're talking about that is lacking in the current system? Or am I wrong? No, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that one of the things is, one, that there's real access to public education. And that's, that's one issue about who has access and who doesn't. Another is, once you're in a school, what kind of education, what kind of education are our children receiving? And again, with the increase in testing, and along with that goes the increase in test prep, our children are losing out. They're losing out in creative kinds of play and thinking mm -hmm. and learning. They're not getting music and art and physical education. And they're not really, teachers aren't allowed to teach and students aren't allowed to learn the kinds of things that we all want our children to learn to become engaged citizens in, mm -hmm. in the world and to be, able to, um, to be able to go out in the world and to be prepared for being, again, being critical thinkers. Yeah. And we also don't encourage teachers. I mean, you said that before. Mm -hmm. We have a, we're watching you. <laughs> you know, you've got to pass your test. Your kids have to pass the test or you're not going to be able to survive in this system. I mean, it's a punitive approach to a teacher, isn't it? It's not, are we educating teachers to be the kind of teachers you would like them to be? Well, I think, I mean, I think there's a number of things happening to teachers. One is that teachers, like parents, like community members, have been pushed out of the system. So again, mm -hmm. the, the the expertise, the knowledge that teachers bring with them is being pushed out and shut down. So for example, who knows better whether a child is learning in a classroom? A teacher. And of course, parents as our children's first educators also have a lot to say. But with this system of testing and with a system of all of, all of those who are involved with public education in the schools being marginalized and pushed out, then we all lose out and teachers aren't able to do the kind of teaching that they would like to do and that they're capable of doing and that they would do if the system didn't constantly put obstacles in their path. And that's what the, the, testing, the testing does. And you know, we have teachers, uh, we have students being tested, we have schools being looked at based on their test scores. We have teachers, again, being looked at based on their test scores. Everything has to do with test scores that we know are unreliable, that we know don't measure what our children are learning. And more and more and more funding is going into that rather than into the classrooms and into our children's education. It's so interesting also when you think about it because when these children come out of school, uh, we're not teaching them responsibility in the world, I think. I mean, I think you can trace so many social ills. Of course, it begins with the family, and we always talk about early childhood education. And you're, you are very involved in a, in a child care center, so we'll come back to that. But it's, it's this important role for parents. Uh, and then it's much more than just learning to pass a test. I mean, I don't remember anything serious about my physics class that I had to pass a regents in. So, but what you, you need to learn things that 
apply to you after you've finished school. I don't know how to say this, but do you know what I'm, I'm yes, saying? Yes, and it's, and it's a larger issue, too. I mean, what you're saying is exactly true. And, you know, for those of us who are concerned about having a just society, yeah, that's... We, we need as a foundation a just public education system. And we need to model the kind of society we want um, for our children, for our future, within right. our public education system. So when you have a system where you have a mayor who is controlling a system where corporate interests have more to say than what's in the best interest of our children, what's really in the best interest of our children, then what are we teaching our children rather than if we had a true partnership mm -hmm. among all of, those, all of us, mm -hmm. parents, teachers, educators, uh, students, community members, together with the mayor and others, um, so that's, and that's the kind of system we'd want to model for our children. Right. One that is about true democracy right, and not about... that's what the essence of the thing is. Right, exactly. But you're right, it's a, it's a corporate, it's a corporate form organization, right? The bottom mm -hmm. line, the bottom line is test scores instead of dollars, but that's what we have as a corporate organization. Um, it's, um, it's, how do you, you can't even, it's hard to enter it <laughs> if you're a parent, if you're an average parent. How do you find the school for your child to go to? That's the thing that's uh, just recently a friend of ours called. He's a grandfather, and he's a, a political person. He's a public relations. He's just the kind of guy that knows everybody or mm -hmm. used to know everybody. So he's used to calling somebody up and getting them here. You know all those favorite things. He's he's got a granddaughter that has some learning problems. He is so frustrated by the system because it's not that he can, can't call somebody to ask them to get her, his child into a school, it's he can't find the schools. He doesn't know how you maneuver in the system. And he's fairly sophisticated. How, what happens if you're here and you, you're not, um, you don't speak English? You got a child that you want to put into school. Where do you go? Well, I think I mean I think there are a number of issues that you're raising. One is that the system right now nobody knows where to go. I mean there have been so many reorganizations, and again because it's this top-down approach, you don't really have access. Having said that, there's also another level, which is who does when who does have access to our schools. Mm -hmm. And for example, in District Three. Um, That's the west side of Manhattan. With the west side of Manhattan, uh, the district that I'm part of and the center I'm part of um, is, is located. Um, there's a history of segregated and unequal schools. And we have a pattern where, you, where we have seen and documented by hundreds and hundreds of parents' stories where they could not get into certain public elementary schools in our neighborhood and in our community. And so a two-tiered system in reality um, evolved, and that's one of the things we're, we're fighting too. The center I'm part of is called the Center for Immigrant Families, and it's an organizing center um, in uptown Manhattan, and really... When you say uptown, where? Um, well, we're located um, in Man the Manhattan Valley neighborhood mm -hmm. of the Upper West Side, and it's really devoted to... That's like um, 103rd, 104th, yes, 106th. that area, yeah. an area where families who've been there for quite some time, along with new families coming, being threatened by gentrification, but still are saying, we're gonna, we, these public schools are our, ours as well. And they don't belong to somebody because they can contribute more money to the school, or because English is their first language, or because they have access to this one or that one. And so it's really a struggle for having access, equity, and really schools that are serving all our children. And that's part of what's happening right now. So does the principal of, of the school have controlling interest in the school? Well, it's, when our project began, um, that was the case for schools that were out of zone, for seats that were out mm -hmm. of zone seats. And so we, um, we documented the mechanisms of exclusion by which uh, families in the community, particularly low-income and families mm -hmm. of color, were being excluded from our public schools. After a period of time, we were able to get a policy change. Hundreds and hundreds of community members came together, and um, we were ultimately able to get a policy change, although there weren't the resources put into it that needed to be, and it wasn't as complete as we were hoping it would be. So the fight continues, and now, it's, there's always something new that's emerging. That's that, another barricade. Right. Or something. It's, let's explain this. The zone school is for a specific area. For It's a last resort, basically. Is well, it? No, many people want their children to go to their zone schools. And in fact, 
One of the things that we think needs to be looked at is the way zone lines are drawn. The underlying question for me and for others is who's benefiting from these policies? And I think we need to ask that repeatedly. And are these policies furthering segregation and inequality or promoting equity? And I think so one of the questions is to look at how the zone lines are drawn. Who are they benefiting? Who's not being served by them? We've come up with a, a proposal, as have others, to look at um, what's called the control choice policy. Uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts has that policy, as do other districts. And that's one of the things that we're looking at um, to think about, again, how to really provide access and equity so that all children have the right to have the kind of education they deserve. But let, let's, I just want to explain for viewers. Um, right now, you have a choice of schools if you want them, if, you're, if you can be accepted in them. Well, and I think the issue of choice is an interesting one because it really ends up being choice for some and right. not for others. It, it means choice for, for, for students who have parents who know how to maneuver the system, right? Well, and it's not only knowing how to maneuver the system, it's who the system responds to right. and who the system and doesn't. That's important. That's important because a lot of times that's the reality and as some well. of those schools are test schools that you have to pass a test to get into? Or well, is that higher up? In, in District school? 3, we have zone schools. Everyone has the right to go to their zone school. And, um, and that takes pre precedence over, over Yes, and that. then we have, for some schools, a lottery. Then there's the gifted and talented programs. There's many different kinds of programs. And what we're always looking at, again, is with these, within, with these programs, who's being served, who's not being served. Uh, if you go through the schools in District 3, we're a district that's largely students of color, yet we have some schools that are majority white students and middle class students. How did that happen? Why does that exist? So we really need to look at what are the patterns that are enabling some families to get access to some of our schools and not. So again, this, this mm -hmm. is part of this overall system um, that's being promoted uh, from the administration we have now, from the Department of Education, from the mayor, where there's no community voice. There's no, um, there's no way for communities to be able to really be partners in this. Now, that doesn't mean communities aren't resisting, and they are and we are, and there are, there's organizing going on across the city. Amazing parents in different schools who are um, fighting the co-locations of their schools by charter schools or other schools, and, and that's a whole uh, another issue. That's, what, that's when a charter school needs space and the Department of Education decides they are going to move into your school. Into your school and basically move, dislocate. Either move you out or crowd you. And again, the question becomes who's being served and yeah. who's not being served. But also school closings mm -hmm. and schools that have said, we need resources. We're wonderful community schools. We just need resources to survive, but instead they're being shut down. Um, what so, kinds of programs are being created so that in some areas you have gifted and talented programs that serve largely white and middle and upper income families. So to look back at all of this or to you know, look from a larger lens and to say, what do we need to do? We need to, it's, a, it's a structural question because it may be that we want to change the attitudes of people. I, I would like to, to say, look, we don't, you don't want to go to a school where your child's privileged over another child. We, we all want to, you know, what's best for our children, to have, be in a mm -hmm. school where all children are respected. But short of that, short of being able to change attitudes, we need a structure a, uh, that doesn't allow that to happen. So it doesn't have to necessarily be decentralized? W or well, would that be an optimum? Thing. Well, I think we, uh, for, for what we think at the Center for Immigrant Families, and I know many others in the city have called for this at well, as well, is to really look at a system of community control of our schools, to go back to the days of Ocean Hill-Brownsville. That, that was a wonderful model. That's where parents came together and said, we want to have a voice in our children's education, from budgeting to curriculum to teachers hiring. It was a beautiful, powerful movement. And for many of us, we go back to that movement, and we say, because... It, it never got to be, it was never enabled to be mm -hmm. brought to fruition. It was never allowed to happen in the way that it was envisioned. And I, so I think, I know for myself and for many others, we really look to that model of a democratic model of communi real community control of our schools. And it's not a quick fix. It's not easy. It takes time. But it's about building a sustained movement. And there's an expression that we use a lot at... Um, at the, Center for, at the Center for Immigrant Families that comes from an Aboriginal uh, community in Australia that says, nothing about us 
without us is for us. And that, to oh, me, that's that, so that's, interesting. That says so much. That's really Cantillia, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah, it is. You're an org you're, you are a, you were trained as a community organizer? No, I was not <laughs> trained. Tra no. no. <laughs> what were you trained as? Um, and my commitment, and the, uh, again, the commitment of yeah. the center I'm part of, and we've now joined a parent organizing collaborative uh -huh. with um, a wonderful group in, Bro in Brooklyn, La Union, and with Advocates for Children, and together with the Bloomingdale Family Programs um, Parent Leadership Project. Uh -huh. Well, and that's, that's so important, isn't it? So, we've, so we, we are all coming together, and our work's based on um, really popular education and participatory action research, which just in one oh, yeah, sentence that's the whole thing. Yeah. is really about building from right. people's own experience, knowledge, and wisdom. There's this talk sometimes about, you know, parents need training. We need to bring outsiders to train parents. And, you know, So we don't view, need management consultants. Right. We need some parents. <laughs> right. There. But the <laughs> point is that who knows better about mm -hmm. what the needs are of a community than the community itself. And so our parent workshops and trainings grow out of parents' stories, and storytelling is really at the heart of our work. And from those stories come the political analysis and an understanding of strategies for organizing and strategies for action. It grows out of the community itself, and it's a very powerful process. And it's, um, it, it, it may, it, it's such a different way of looking at it that it's startling, basically, you know? <laughs> but it, it's so sensible. That's what, that's what the, uh, the common sense about it is. It's so incredible that people think they can educate the children by decreeing <laughs> <laughs> down at uh, wherever they are. I grew up with Livingston Street or better, whatever. <laughs> um, without taking, I mean, and especially nowadays with all the immigrant groups we have coming in and the educations we're doing. Your cho you had children that went to a dual language school? Yes, they went to um, a wonderful dual language program in District 3 where um, all families were respected and all families were valued and it really, um, you saw it at every level. It was a wonderful school community and in addition to learning both languages, both Spanish and English, there was also a real respect for one another's cultures and histories and identities and it was, I think, a, a, a very wonderful experience. Why isn't every school a dual language school? That, I don't know, I think dual language bilingual education is, is so important and um, Ophelia Garcia, who's a noted bilingual education expert at the CUNY Grad Center, you know, she refers to um, English language learners as emergent bilinguals and to really show again this notion of what people bring with them, not what people don't have, but what people bring with them. And, you know, from my own experience and my children's experience, I can say it was, it was, um, very important on a num on many levels, uh, and it was again a, a school where each child felt valued for who they were, and their families felt valued. And the families were totally involved. Oh, very much so. Yeah. It was a real community partnership. But your children started at, at a, a child care center. Yes, you cite two 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 different educational sites as examples of really what you're talking about. Right. Yes. Um, Bloomingdale. Yeah. I just actually the piece that yeah. I just wrote. Yeah. Um, the Bloomingdale Family Program and the Julia Richmond Education Complex are two educational institutions that I think are amazing models of what education can be. Um, I will feel forever grateful that my children were able to have be part of both of these communities and that we as parents were Who able to be. Who started the Bloomingdale Project, you know? Um, well, it was started by Susan Feingold and a number of other people coming together. She's I think a child really, care special, she, early childhood um, educator. Well, actually, she, she's, and she just recently retired, she's an incredible person who I believe was a um, child refugee um, from Nazi Germany mm -hmm. and um, was part of perhaps the first or one of like an integrated theater company. Mm -hmm. And then she and other mothers, if I'm not mistaken, I might not yeah, be getting the right. full well, story correct, yeah. but she's um, started what's become um, a uh, three sites, a Head Start Center, and it's really a place where you see parent-school community partnership, where you see every family valued. Um, the teachers, many of the teachers were former parents at the school. And, um, and, and it's just a community that really respects the families and the children and understands play, the mm. importance of play for three and four year olds. And they're learning all the time, but okay. in this joyful, wonderful environment. And they recognize that testing is not what's, you know, yeah, the high stakes testing. And Julia Richmond has six schools. 
Um, my daughter went to the elementary middle school. My son went for a period of time to one of the high schools. And it's just a community that's come together that, again, values students, values families, teaches critical thinking, doesn't teach to the test. It's such a creative, rigorous curriculum. I mean, the first time I learned about the school was I went to speak there at the time I was doing work around Israel and Palestine, and I went to speak in a class, and I was blown away. I've been speaking to adult groups. I had never experienced such a, they were prepared. They asked me very tough questions. Um, at, at a point, something I said, one of the students said, I, I don't mean to be disrespectful. I enjoyed what you said, but that was an oxymoron. <laughs> and he was right, it was. <laughs> I won't say what it was I said because it's no longer what I believe, but he was absolutely right. And so it's a school where you go where there's a love of learning. You walk and into the school, it's different. It's right? different. Oh, you have your, well, the, and you don't and you have kids it. sitting outside uh, the no, doors right. waiting because they were late or something, right? right? right. Sitting in the, uh, and the security, it's, it's a family yeah. and community it, in, in the best sense of the word. So if the Bloomberg and Klein, formerly Klein administration, were going to be looking at models of how to think about our schools, they would be going right to the Julia Richmond Education Complex. They have some of the best educators, both teachers and administrators, they would be looking there and saying, what can we learn from these wonderful Well, they moments? come from other parts of the country oh. and the world to go there. Everyone else does. Everyone right. else, same thing at Bloomingdale, both at Bloomingdale and at JREC. People come from all over to world, right. the world to, to look really, at these things. To, yeah, know. and then, but, but these people, most of them, they spend a lot of time fighting with our Department of Education in the state. Right, trying you know, to, to do to the time them. they have to spend. To Trump, defend yeah. what they're doing, which is, and you know, it's, it's, they have done studies to show that the students who use performance-based assessment as urban and many others, the urban academy mm -hmm. within Jarek and many other schools do. They're exempt, aren't they? From, they've for, gotten themselves exempt. After really I know. fighting for it. But if yeah. you look at what they do, it's a very, it's very rigorous requirements that really requires all the things our students our children we're talking about. yeah that we're talking about and their their students are doing well in college yeah. they've done and the most of them go to, I mean it's 98 oh, percent or something right most go to college and they're doing well in college and so again it's it's a model so um, yeah so <laughs> is our public our public education system is a um, it's a discriminatory body basically I mean it's something like 85 percent people of color is it that much it's a, I think it's um, around that percentage now and I think that yes you can really see um, you know uh, you really see a, a two-tiered system and I was starting to say yeah. a little bit about district 3 that right. most recently um, in two of our wonderful community schools uh, PS 145 and PS 165 in the Manhattan Valley area um, there was a you know, we're told the charters coming in, Eva Moskovitz's charters coming in. Well, the community, these are wonderful schools, and the parents who love their schools yeah. and the teachers yeah. all rallied together to say, hands off our schools. Our schools serve the community. Our schools have been doing a wonderful job, and you've got to let us flourish. And you can't think, because we're uptown schools, and we're kids that are schools that are mostly serving kids of color, and they really serve kids, there's both schools that serve um, English language learners and kids with special needs and really are open to the community. They're community institutions. And so the community rallied behind and said, um, goodbye. This is, yeah, we're not going to do it. And you know, the fight's yeah. not over. There's still yeah. constantly assaults. But um, I don't think they, uh, I think they underestimated the power of the, of the community. So your Center for um, Immigrant Families is not necessarily just based around a school. It's the parents, it's people right. in the community. Parents come, members come from many different schools in the community and it's really too. And it's through mutual discussion and organizing in their own self mm -hmm. that they develop their strategies, they develop their knowledge mm -hmm. it's, and it's, their skills at protecting their kind of education. Yeah, there's no campaign. It's a website it's, for it. Yeah, there's no campaign, well it's being re, re, okay. redone right now, but there's, there's no campaign that's like said, oh, we're gonna start with this campaign. Right. It's through the community right. workshops, through the process of sharing stories, the organizing yeah. emerges from that. And the way that the public education became an issue is that at one of the community workshops that was actually held at the Bloomingdale Family Program, person after person started talking about how they couldn't get their children into our local public schools, into our mm -hmm. district public schools. That's what I was talking about, and, because they didn't understand how. And, and no, because they were told, go uptown. Oh. There was nobody there. Translations required by law. Oh. They'd go down and they'd be told, 
there's no translation or available. To, or they'd say, go, go uptown where you'll Washington be more comfortable Heights. or whatever it would be. And we have a small district, so oh, it's, it's a yeah. district that really is right. accessible and people can travel easily. And so after a while, people realize, wait a minute, this isn't an individual story. This isn't someone's own you know, individual story. This is a systemic, collective uh -huh. problem. And that's how the project grew out of. Uh, it's the project to challenge segregation yeah. in our schools. It grew out of those individual stories and recognizing that, that a group wanted to come together to take collective action. So when the website gets finished or redone, what's the website? It's c4if.org. C4if.org. And I, we're basically at the end of our program, and I haven't even asked how you became the person you are and what those interests were. So I think you're going to need to come back. But <laughs> we need, I mean, do you feel that you're growing in, in gathering more people together to do this? I think there's a growing movement. And again, I don't think, I mean, I think the CIF and Bloomingdale and Uptown Community is wonderful, but there are many other communities across the city. There are educators, there are parents all over. If you really pay attention, you know, sometimes they say, oh, there's a small group of opposition. It's, it's a large group of parents and community members and educators, and it's growing. And committed. And very, very committed. And I learn every day from, you know, from those who, and also lots of young people, yeah. I mean, we didn't even talk yeah. about that, but the student organizing and the organizing of young people, that's just so, you know, Well, you better profound. spread out because it <laughs> sounds like the future of the world is going to be coming from, your, from this pro kind of education, and we need to convince people to have it, right? I don't know. Yeah, it's I, a, I think we're, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a big, um, yeah. I, but I think that um, it's, change is, change is going to happen because there are so many people out there you know, parents care deeply about their and our children's education. All parents do. And um, so yes. nobody's going to sit quietly Good. by. <laughs> Thank you very much, <laughs> Donna Neville. <laughs> Thank you for having me. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.